Meta's AI app is exposing people's cheating confessions, dating advice, medical records, legal battles, all publicly. We're talking real names, real screenshots, home addresses, even voice memos, all showing up on the app's public feed. Don't believe me? Take a look at this. Yes, this was published from a private meta AI conversation. The wild part is that most users have no idea they're broadcasting their lives on the internet. Today, I'm breaking down how this is one of the worst AI data privacy fails so far, and I'll show you how to shut it off before you or your grandfather's social security number ends up on Meta's discovery feed. If you've ever used AI like a diary and you're suddenly panicking right now, don't worry, hit that subscribe button, I've got your back. Seriously, how did this get through QA? We'll also cover the other AI updates you need to know, including how OpenAI just took a real step forward forward towards creating actually helpful AI agents through the launch of O3 Pro and the release of the first ever AI training data set built entirely from legally vetted data. I'm looking at you, AI companies who said we just had to steal off the internet. Okay. All right, let's get into it. First up, so people are accidentally leaking their medical records, affairs, and desperate dating strategies straight into the public feed of Meta's AI app. A lot of folks, especially older users, think they're using a private journal. The result are these gems being published publicly on Facebook. You can't make this up. Just raw personal data posted publicly for the world to scroll through. Real talk, guys. How many of you feel like you've shared a bit of personal information with a chatbot, used it as a therapist, maybe fed it something that you shouldn't? Metasys posts are only shared if users tap through a specific share workflow. Clearly, they didn't dummy proof the process enough, though, because people think they're talking to a private assistant, not publishing to a social feed. Meta, fire all of your product people because it's your responsibility to build tech in a way that protects your users from doing stupid things like publishing private things on the internet. Okay, here's how to shut it off. Make sure to take a screenshot of this next screen. Step one, tap your profile photo in the top right corner of the Meta AI app, scroll down and hit data and privacy. Under suggesting your prompts on other apps, find each app listed like Facebook and Instagram and toggle them off. But you're not done, ho ho ho, thanks Meta for always making it super hard to protect your data, classic. Go back to the main data and privacy screen, tap manage your information, click make all your public prompts visible only to you and then hit apply to all. You can also delete your entire prompt history off of this page. Next up, there was a new model released this week and it's not another AI chatbot. It's a model that your boss is about to integrate to finally make AI agents work. OpenAI just dropped O3 Pro, another model release. Ah. But this one is different. It's not built for casual chat anymore. It's built for what agents are supposed to be doing. Deep reasoning, tool use, and long context tasks. Think less fun facts about sea otters and why isn't my boyfriend responding to my texts and more generate a full product map with these 14 meeting transcripts. So you see the potential, right? Now, here's the funny part. I was Googling O3 Pro to prep for this episode and suddenly I see my brother, second result on Google with the world's first public review on Latin space. I didn't even know he published it. Thanks, Ben. But in his review with co-founder Alexis Gava, they nailed the mindset shift perfectly. O3 Pro works best when treated like a report generator, not a chatbot. You have to load it with strategy docs, product plans, even voice memos, then ask for an analysis. It needs a ridiculous amount of context and structure. To put that into something visual, how many of you saw this graphic floating around X a few months ago showing the anatomy of a great AI prompt? That graphic was actually also made by my brother and this right here is the updated version comparing O03 Pro. With O03, you give it a goal, a format, and maybe some context, and then you're good. But O3 Pro is hungry. It wants call transcripts, meeting notes, tool access, system level instructions. It wants a lot of data to do its best work. But there's always a but. O3 Pro is painfully slow. Someone just said hi and it took six minutes to respond. Six minutes. So not your go-to for small talk, clearly. It's built for planning, analysis, orchestration, and the price point is super high, so it reflects that shift. OpenAI is clearly moving from chatbots for all to specialized intelligence tailored to the task. So the TLDR, if O3 and most of the other models are your generalist, 
O3 Pro is your first major step towards AI agents. Do you guys think that O3 Pro will actually be helpful towards the development of AI agents or just another release? Let me know what you think in the comments. Update number three, AI companies lied about needing to steal content. For years, the narrative has been the same. We had no choice to build advanced AI. We had to scrape the web. Copyright, ethics, we'll figure that out later. But this week, that story was thrown out to the garbage as the first major AI training data set built entirely unlicensed and legally vetted data was released. It's called CommonPile, an eight terabyte data set created by Eleuther AI with a monster list of collaborators like Hugging Face, MIT, and Cornell. It took them two years to build it and filter out anything remotely questionable, even rejecting the most popular data sets used by the major AI companies like Open Alex or YouTube Commons. Every single piece of data was either directly verified with the rights holder or pulled from crystal clear public domain sources, which that is all super noble, but I know what you guys are thinking, how well does it perform? Turns out, shockingly well. Early benchmarks show that the models trained on clean data performs nearly as well as models trained on scraped content, sometimes even better. We were told that this wasn't possible. Turns out it was. Now, I know people are gonna have mixed reactions to this. Some will say, see, the companies always lied. And others will say they didn't know, they were just experimenting. And honestly, both are a little true. This early wave of generative AI moved fast without a lot of rules, but that's what makes this release so important. CommonPile just proved that ethical data can perform and scale. And let's be honest, almost every major AI company today is facing lawsuits about how they trained their models. Like, look at that. Governments, institutions, and even enterprise buyers can't afford that kind of legal fog long-term. So this gives us a playbook on how to move forward. If you're on the technical side and want to see the super impressive pipeline that they use to clean the data, I'll link the paper in the description. Everyone else, do you think long-term building AI models on purely legally vetted data is feasible? Next up, a speed round of mini updates you should know, but don't need to know a lot about them. First off, Apple completely flopped at this year's WWDC. Last year, they hyped up Apple intelligence like it was going to change everything and this year barely a whisper like at all instead they gave us liquid glass a shiny new ui design that is trying so hard to look cool but kind of fails and is a accessibility nightmare i'm not even 30 and i can't even read my phone anymore some people think it's apple conditioning us for future spatial computing devices like visual prep for vision pro 2 i think that's a stretch i just have a question though how is x beating apple in the ai race like that's not a sentence i thought i'd ever say next anthropics fully written ai blog is dead it was meant to flex cloud's writing skills but apparently no one wants to read a blog with zero human voice I just found that one hilarious. Humans keep fighting. Third, a US government vaccine website has been defaced and is now hosting what appears to be AI generated spam, including, yes, furry. I'm super uncomfortable. Are you uncomfortable? I don't wanna say that word out loud. I don't wanna report this news. It's run by the Department of Health and Human Services and no one knows who did it or why but it's definitely not about vaccines anymore. And the last major update for this week, a new model by the company that owns TikTok. If you've ever tried to convert a PDF into something that's actually usable, you already know it's 2025, we're in the age of AI, but apparently we still can't seem to figure out document parsing. But ByteDance might've just fixed your enterprise PDF nightmare. This one's a little bit more technical, so it's best suited for devs, but it's also helpful for anyone who's fought with file layout issues, OCR, or 17 versions of the same Word file. If you know, you know. By ByteDance just launched a new multimodal document parsing model called Dolphin, taking a fresh approach to one of the oldest annoyances in enterprise tech, converting complex documents into structured, readable content without destroying the layout. ByteDance says current approaches break down when documents get too complex or become inefficient to scale, both for traditional OCR or even advanced vision language models. Dolphin claims to have fixed this issue with a two-stage analyze then parse flow. First, it analyzes the full page using Swin transformers to extract layout elements in proper reading order. Quick side note, Swin transformers, short for shifted window transformers, are a visual model architecture from Microsoft that breaks the image into small windows and processes them locally instead of overwhelming the system by analyzing the full page at once. It's like scanning the page through a smart magnifying glass 
class piece by piece. This helps Dolphin identify structure, think headers, tables, formulas, and map everything using prompts. Then each element is cropped out and parsed in parallel, which makes the whole process both faster and more accurate. It's not perfect, but it's a glimpse into the future of document workflows that don't require duct tape solutions and eight different APIs just to get one solid output. So for example, I know a lot of people in the translation industry, PDF conversions are a nightmare. Maybe finally we're getting closer to a world where parsing a document doesn't feel like you're performing surgery with a butter knife. And that's it for this week. Please remember to comment, like, and subscribe. It means the world to me. I read every single one. One question before you go, what was your favorite thing you learned about this week? Please let me know in the comments. And maybe if you really enjoyed it, consider fueling me with a coffee to keep me going so I don't cry. It's stressful. This is a stressful life. YouTube is a stressful place. Like, I don't know why anybody would subject themselves to this. Bye.